Greetings and welcome back to room 303 AP English. And we now are going to turn to the topic, a global pandemic, a literary response. Obviously, unless you've been living in a strange place, you probably already know that the World Health Organization has now defined a global pandemic. And of course, right away, we have to ask the question, what is, what is our response from a literary perspective? Because let's go ahead and begin in our notes this way. We've said it many times. The new is the new. Let's spell it, though. The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. Once you've written it, look at that line for just a moment, and let's be reminded of the fact that we fail to respect often that, as a famous literary text suggests, there is nothing new under the sun. Either N-E-W or K-N-E-W. That is to say, it's odd how we've been here before, but it's also odd how we read history. I mean, think about this. Of course, we read history and we read about pandemics, but we don't really understand until we experience. Let's put that in our notes as well. I mean, I think that's significant. We don't often know until we really experience, and then we come to know. We're like, oh, this is what this feels like. Of course, here's what we don't want to do, all right? So a good number of you are asking, you know, this is something that's real, it's happening. How do you, how, how do you respond to it? Like, what's the best way to respond to it? I think, let's, let's say two don'ts right away, shall we? And we're going to use, again, literature, our stories, to help remind us of the best ways how not to respond. One, of obviously, um, we don't want to uh, somehow pretend as if nothing is happening. That is to say, we don't want to underreact. I mean, we think, for example, in Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, the famous train in the tunnel story, right? You can pretend as if something tragic is not going to happen, and in fact, something definitely tragic happens. Under-responding is obviously not what we don't. I mean, we don't want to pretend as if nothing is going on. To try to convince ourselves, no, 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 this is fine, nothing is happening. Obviously, we don't want to do that. But conversely, our stories remind us we don't want to overreact either. Arthur Miller's Crucible immediately comes to mind as a classic text for us. The mass hysteria that can be created when a good number of people begin to overreact. We don't want to do that either. How do we want to respond? Well, I'm going to make the argument here. Obviously, there's a lot of responses. There's political responses, there are economic responses, any number of other kind of responses. Our response here is to concentrate on a literary response. I mean, we are in an AP class, so let's ask some simple questions. What's the best way for us to respond? Why? Well, I think our stories matter to us. I've been saying from the time we've been together, we are the stories we tell and the stories we retell. We're also, of course, the stories we accept and the stories we reject. And any time that a situation like this happens, you will inevitably have people that will say, this is not really happening. Whatever story you're telling me, I'm going to reject that story. So this is an interesting time for you as students to be studying the very thing we've been saying. We are the stories that we tell, the stories we retell, and of course the stories we'll either accept or reject. The question obviously for us is, what are the stories that can speak most to this circumstance? And as well, what does this experience for us mean as qualified by our big five, as we call them? That is to say, what does this experience tell us epistemologically, what we can know, ontologically, who we are, psychologically, how the individual mind thinks and works, especially during times of crises, sociologically, the study of groups, and then finally, and maybe most significantly, if you've been following any media coverage of this, theodicy. The question of why, why is this happening and the like, and what is it that our texts can speak to us regarding this very dynamic. Let's talk about classics for a moment, because sometimes, of course, in AP, we have to ask the question, why these texts and not other texts? Often the response is, well, we study classics. What is a classic? We don't call it a classic because it ends up on some list or some group of small people decided these are the canonized classics. I want to argue, rather, hopefully we can 
put this into actually kind of experimental mode right now. I want to argue that a classic is a classic, if it's a classic at all, because it speaks directly to our experiences. It helps to qualify our experiences. Right? Think about the classics and begin to ask simple questions. What you're feeling, what you're experiencing. Can these classics, can these texts speak at all? Think about, for example, the craziness of the storming of the Bastille and the hysteria that ensues in Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. And the ways in which that hysteria leads to the very destruction of the very neighborhoods where the most disenfranchised people live. Think about the ways in which Golding's Lord of Flies speaks to the way human behavior will happen under moments of duress and stress. But what I want to do is I want to go back in our curriculum to the very beginning. Let's just go through a, a real quick rundown of some of the titles that we've worked with and ask simple questions about how these titles speak directly to some of the experiences that we are now experiencing and we will continue to experience going forward. Let's begin, of course, with our epics. If epics are anything, they are narrative poems that tell stories that will somehow resemble real life. And of course, since we began with the Iliad in our time together, we'll begin with the Iliad now. And immediately, some of you even smiling to be reminded that the Iliad, of course, opens with Apollo shooting, of course, his invisible arrows down. And of course, that is, you're right, that's a form of, that's a form of the plague, as Camus will call it the plague, right? And, and, and that is to say, right away, the Iliad and then, of course, the Odyssey, Homer's classic. And as well, Virgil's Aeneid. What do these titles speak to us about in regards to the very experience that we are now enjoying? I think one of the central things is, of course, the hero. So let's remind ourselves, why are these texts precious in our culture? Because they say, this is what heroes are. They will act in heroic fashion with courage in the face of adversity. Which is why for some of you, far more heroic than Achilles is Hector in the Iliad, right? We look at these heroes as characters to emulate in some ways, in other ways, no, we are the stories we reject. But as we look at these stories as our classics of origination in our Western thought, we find ourselves, of course, rep representing the hero as the struggler, the one who's trying to come to terms with the inevitability, the futility of existence. Achilles caught in a situation out of which there doesn't seem to be no easy kind of exit, and he's somewhat paralyzed until he's forced into action. Let's think about, of course, to continue our heroic motif, Beowulf, who has to, of course, stand up and fight against monsters. And we'll remember in our lectures that we said these monsters are allegorical of different kinds of evil. Right? Grendel representing that evil which is face on. Grendel's mother representing that evil that's not so easy to be seen. Right, That more metaphysical evil and then ultimately that dragon at the conclusion of Beowulf which is the evil you can't beat. You can only fight against it. But notice, remember, Beowulf can only destroy the dragon with the help of Wiglaf. The communal aspect, the only way sometimes we get through tragedy is together, not alone, even if you're a hero. Of course, King Arthur comes to mind, as does Roland in the great classic French poem that we've studied, Song of Roland. I want to think about Gilgamesh, the classic Babylonian epic poem. What did we learn when we studied Gilgamesh? There are forces, and this is what makes us human, there are forces that we can't defeat. We have to find some way to live alongside. We have to reconcile with our humanity, and they have a word for that. It's called humility. And of course, T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, East Quoker comes to mind. The only wisdom we can hope to acquire is the wisdom of humility. We'll come back to that as a central idea in a moment. Think about Chaucer. Canterbury Tales, that classic text of satire. And it is true that we will begin to witness, and have already begun to witness, 
What Chaucer was pointing out as well, in moments of, and, I'm re and you'll remember, of course, Chaucer writing during a time on the planet when there was a bit of an epidemic as well, you'll remember, right? Plague, the Black Plague, the bubonic plague. The idea for Chaucer, of course, is that when we find ourselves in these kinds of circumstances, it's a natural thing to ask about our institutions of stability, our authority institutions. Where are they? Where were they? And to what degree can we trust what it is that we're hearing and see, listening to? We would be remiss, of course, in a situation like this to not mention our Dante. This is one of the reasons why we study our Dante. Of course, the idea of Dante's journey through Inferno will remind us that it begins, the poem, begins with a lost in the middle of a dark wood moment. And then, of course, an awakening. I'm lost. I've got to figure out some stuff. It is altogether possible, as Dante suggested, that some of the worst experiences of our life, both individually and communally, are propedeutic in nature, instructional, didactic. They can lead us to begin to try and find some kind of answer. But we're only going to get that answer through a long, hard journey. And at some moment, we're going to want to sit down and we're going to want to quit. And that's why Virgil's words to Dante, up on your feet. This is no time to tire will resonate for us. It's one of the reasons we, of course, committed those lines to memory in the days to come. It's altogether possible that some of us will feel the collective fatigue, the individual fatigue that will be a part of this experience, and we'll want to listen to Dante's words from Virgil to Dante the Pilgrim. You can't quit. You can't give up. You got to get up. You got to keep going. There is a, what is it? Higher ladder yet to climb. There's more to be done. Of course, we studied next, after our Dante, we studied our Shakespeare. And obviously, I mean, so many titles come to mind here. We said a whole lot about, in our study of Shakespeare, that it's clear he wants to challenge us to ask the simple question about trust. Can you trust yourself? Can you trust others? How do you know that? And of course, Hamlet immediately comes to mind in a circumstance like the one that we're now going through, and, and, and of course, in the days to come. The questions of why, for sure, they're paramount. Why is this happening? How can I respond to it in an intelligent way? We see in Hamlet that frozen moment. What do I do? Do nothing, as opposed to doing too much. Shakespeare's classic portrayal of confusion speaks to us as well. After Shakespeare, of course, we come to Milton. In some ways, some of you will say, of all the titles that we've studied, maybe Milton is the title of all titles in a situation like the one we are witnessing now. The question, of course, is the question of theodicy. Can you explain why this is happening? And our instincts are, of course, immediately to begin to find someone to blame, or some institution to blame, or some people to blame. The xenophobia, you will witness it the xenophobia immediately can become paramount. Let's find some place where all of this originates, point the finger, and then we'll be able to somehow gain some sense of justification to justify the ways of God to men. Is Milton's very language in the opening lines of Paradise Lost One. I'll just finish with Faust. I mean, we could be playing this game forever and ever. Our titles speak to the challenge of human adversity and how one addresses human adversity, how a people address human adversity. But Faust will forever remind us that we are our choices, that we live in a world where we get to choose how we respond to the events that happen to us. And to that degree, we argue we do have free will by virtue of the fact that we get to choose now, of course, there's some things we don't get to choose. Whether, for example, we come into contact, maybe we have some idea of how we can choose that, but other times, not so much contact, the pain or the suffering of life. Obviously, we wish to reduce it as much as we can, but our Plato and our study of Republic reminds us pain can be instructional, can be propedutive. And the idea, of course, of emancipating ourselves from the darkness of the cave is all about the choice. And Faust, the classic exemplar of this, he has to make a choice. 
First, his choice, of course, is not a very useful choice. Ultimately, his choice of action, we will define it through Goethe's great poem as worthy of emulation, the worthiness of an action that is well intended, at least considerable intended. Well, what about our big five? Let's finish, shall we? What is it that we have learned in our study together that can inform an experience like this from the perspective of our big five? One, epistemology. What can you know? We've already said we can have an epistemological position that's the absolutist position. Of course, the only problem with the absolutist position, I'm right and everybody else is wrong, is that we can, we can do some really crazy stuff when we're convinced we're right and everybody else is wrong. The absolutist position forces many of us to think about the relativist position. Well, there is no truth and it really doesn't matter. Of course, this is an interesting moment in a pandemic. Notice all the people who for a long time have been saying life is meaningless and it doesn't matter and now they're ready to work really hard to stay healthy. Wow, that's interesting. Hmm. See, the relativist position doesn't work. That is to say, there is no truth is itself a positive a truth. And to that degree, the performative contradiction pretty much nails dead the relativist position. But there is that middle position that we've argued from the very beginning of our study with Plato and then through our study of Nietzsche, the idea of the fallibilist position. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And it's that I could be wrong part, which leads epistemologically to the position of humility, the willingness to admit, we don't know everything. And that's a good thing to learn. And sometimes a certain kind of global catastrophe can remind us of that. And in our sometimes tendencies towards intellectual arrogance, we can be a little bit humbled and a little bit humble is not so bad epistemologically. What are we going to say about ontology? Who we are, fundamentally who we are. Well, we're reminded, we're human, we're fallible, we're not bulletproof, and even Achilles has his Achilles heel. That is to say, we've got to represent ourselves in a very holistic way, an integral way, we might say. And to that degree, again, yeah, we got to make sure that we're constantly learning, learning through experiences. We are a species that is innately curious. That's why stories matter to us. As we go through this process, we want to remind ourselves that fundamentally, we are human when we choose to be human, to behave in humane ways. Our stories obviously help to teach us how to do that well. Psychologically, our next of the big five. Well, I think this is important. We began with some comment about Arthur Miller's Crucible, and clearly we've got to pay attention to this. The fear, the anxiety that naturally attends moments in life of uncertainty, especially when it becomes something larger than your school or your town or even your nation, and it becomes a global pandemic. We got to pay attention to the ways in which though that fear and that anxiety can lead us to actions that are less than heroic, back to our comments of Homer. And of course, we want to make sure that we're not damaging an already damaged situation. Sociologically, I think this is really significant in our study of our stories. Sociologically, what does this experience say for us? Well, clearly, on the one hand, mass hysteria isn't going to help anything. Pay attention to the ways that groups have a tendency to begin to kind of coalesce around the worst imaginable scenario, possibilities. If mass hysteria isn't what we seek then in a moment like this, sociologically speaking, what is it? All of our titles have in some ways, and this is what makes them classics, been suggesting to us there's a better way sociologically. Let's call it, for your notes, generous, intentional, unity. Right? Remember what Plato argues in Republic. A people who are harmonious, who are unified, are powerful people. The great mythologist Joseph Campbell, following the work of Carl Jung, argued that one of the things that would happen in the 21st century was that the world would begin to find reasons to overcome all of the divisions that were obviously so prevalent in the 20th century. 
the wars that we fought over silliness, and begin to unify. He argued that it would happen over issues, many of which he listed, one of them was the environmental challenges. Obviously, something like this that we're experiencing now might lead to that kind of greater increasing humanity, unity, instead of the xenophobia, which naturally always seems to happen in these kinds of experiences. Let's finish, of course, with the last of our big five. Many of you have argued this might be the question of all questions. It's the theodicy question. Why is this happening? If there's anything our stories, our classics are teaching to us, I think it's this. We have to learn to ask the right question. We can't ask, why did this happen to me? We picture ourselves as somehow a victim in a universe. We have no control over what is happening, and we ask, why did this happen to us or to me? This is a wasted question. It's a useless question, and ultimately, it's a dangerous question because it can lead to a certain kind of solipsism and nihilism which cannot improve either our own life or the lives of those around us. I think it's important for us to learn to ask not why did this happen to me or to us, but rather why did this happen for me, for us. We're not saying that we're giddy or happy about the fact that all of this is uh, uh, happening for us. Clearly it's going to mess with our rhythms. Clearly it's going to change the way that we live and see this world. No doubt about that. We can obviously be frustrated. But beyond our frustration, there must be this question. What can I learn from this experience? How can I grow from this experience? And someday, far into the future, when I'm a grandma, when I'm a grandpa, and somebody asks about, hey, weren't you a part of... We want to be able to say in a positive way, I was a part of it. I was a part of it. Find somebody who you don't really know that well. Befriend them. Comfort them. Be a person in the storm of courage, of integrity, of honor. Our stories suggest